who's tuning in around the world and welcome to this special discussion at the Moscow International Book Fair hosted by the International Pub Publishers Association. Uh, I'm Bedour al Qasimi. I'm the Vice President of IPA. I'm honored to be moderating this discussion today, which will focus on the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic around the world and its impact on publishing. I want to thank the Russian Book Union for arranging this forum to discuss what I believe is potentially one of the most significant threats the publishing industry has faced in a long time. We have a great panel with us today, which includes publishers, both trade and educational, booksellers, publishing association representatives, and policymakers. Many of you also wear several hats, so I'm happy that we can explore the intersection in publishing ecosystem that ultimately get books into the hands of readers. Today, I want to cover with you several key themes, the impact of coronavirus on the global publishing industry and in your countries, how publishing will change as a result of the current challenge, and how stakeholders across the publishing ecosystem can work together on a global response to COVID-19 to ensure that we can recover from what has been an extremely tough time for the book business. To coincide with the closing of this session, the IPA will release a call to action, which will be available on our website, which is internationalpublishers.org. Speaking on behalf of the world publishing community, we call on governments everywhere to treat the book sector as essential to society, to take steps to stimulate demand for books and up their game to protect intellectual property. The document contains a list of recommendations that we believe need to be implemented to protect the publishing industry and the contribution to society everywhere, to literacy, learning, culture, and creativity. That said, I'd like now to introduce our amazing six panelists who are all very experienced book sector leaders from around the world. From the United States of America, we have Maria Palante, who's with us early, very early in the morning. Thank you for joining us so early, Maria. Maria Palante is the president and CEO of the Association of American Publishers, AAP. The role followed a dual career, leading copyright lawyer and company executive, including the, the Guggenheim Art Museum uh, for nearly a decade and serving at the helm of the US Copyright Office for six years. Maria has delivered and published a number of major lectures, including the Next Great Copyright Act at Columbia University, and I am the captain now resisting piracy and contortion in the copyright marketplace at the University of Wisconsin. Welcome, Maria. Thank you, Badur. Good morning to everyone. Welcome. And uh, next we have uh, from Germany, Joachim Kaufmann. Uh, Joachim was born into a family owned publishing house founded in 1816. He was fascinated by publishing as a child. He worked in different German publishing houses such as Herder, Christophorus, Random House and Ravensburger, mainly in marketing and sales. And since 20, 2006, he's been the CEO of Carlson Publishing, the market leading publishing house for children's and young adult publishing, comics, manga and cartoons. Carlson is part of the Swedish Bonnier Group and publishes more than 1000 new titles per year. Welcome, Joachim. Thank you, Badur, and good morning to everyone. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Laura Prinsloo from Indonesia. Laura left her career in finance to become a publisher. She heads Kesant Pu Blank Publishing and Printing based in Jakarta and has subsequently moved into other industries. In 2016, Laura became the chairperson for the Indonesian National Committee, um, 2016 to, sorry, National Book Committee, 2016 to 2019, an entity established by the Ministry of Education and Culture following Indonesia's successful appearance as guest of honor at 2015 Frankfurt Book Fair. She also chaired the committee for Indonesia as the market focus country at the London Book Fair in 2019. Laura is the chair of 17,000 Islands of Imagination Foundation, the co-founder of Jakarta Content Week, an event in rights trade and IP marketplace for Asia Pacific region, jointly organized with the Frankfurt Book Fair. 
And recently, she was appointed by the Jakarta provincial government as the executive chair for Jakarta Book City Committee, who are responsible for various book-related activities in the city, including Jakarta's bid for the IPA Congress 2022 and UNESCO World Book Capital City in 2022. Welcome, Laura. Hello all, good afternoon from Jakarta. Thank you for joining. And then we have Maria Hamrefors from Sweden. Maria is the chairman of the Swedish Booksellers Association and a member of the Exec Executive Committee of the European and International Booksellers Federation, EIBF. Maria has held executive positions in bookselling and publishing for the last 30 years, including CEO of Sweden's leading bookseller with 100 plus stores, Academy Boken Den, uh, an online bookstore. I'm sorry if I <laughs> pronounced that wrong. She was also the CEO of Norse's Norse Debts Publishing Group, CEO Libra Educational Publisher, CEO of Thomson Core in Sweden, and held senior positions for Thomson Legal Publishing in London. Current assignments include the position as chairman of UR, Swedish Educational Broadcasting Company, part of the Public Service Broadcasting Group. Welcome, Maria. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. And thank you so much for struggling with those Swedish names. Thank you. <laughs> I'll get there eventually. You did well, very well. <laughs> Thank you, Maria. And then um, we have Oleg Novikov from the Russian Federation. Oleg is president of the largest publishing group in Russia, Exmo AST, and owner of the federal bookselling network Chitai Gorod Bookved, and the publishing house Man Ivanov and Ferber. Oleg is a board member of the Russian Book Union, who has been awarded the title of Honored Worker of Culture of the Russian Federation. He drove the national program for the support and development of reading and other projects to popularize literature in Russia. And along with the Russian Book Union, he implements hundreds of events and programs annually in support of books and reading in Russia. Welcome, Oleg. Hello. And last but not least, we have Vladimir Grigoryev, also from Russia. Vladimir is the deputy director of Russia's Federal Agency for Press and Mass Communications. He's a professional linguist and translator who's fluent in English, Spanish, Polish, and Ukrainian, but began his career in the 1980s as a journalist and editor for the Novosti Press Agency. Vladimir moved into book publishing in the late 80s and in 1992 set up his own publishing house, Vagrios. In 1997, he founded the movie production and distribution company Premier Film and produced a number of films and TV programs. Vladimir is also on the Russian Book Union Board. He's the chair of the Board of Trustees of the Russian National Big Book Literacy, Literary Prize and chairman of the organizing committee of the Moscow International Book Fair. Welcome, Vladimir. Oh, thank you very much. And thank you for uh, organizing that event during the Moscow Book Fair. Thank you for co-hosting this with us. We're very proud to be uh, present at the virtually at the Moscow International Book Fair with this esteemed panel of speakers. Now we have six panelists and a lot of questions to get through. So I'm going to start with my first question. And then later on, we're going to open the floor for any questions from the audience. Um, we also have um, this live streamed on uh, our, the IPA YouTube channel, and also on the on Moscow International Book Fair uh, YouTube channel. So we hope to get a lot of questions from the audience. But let's start with my first question about the global book industry, checking the pulse. While there's been some talk at the national level on the impact of the coronavirus crisis on the publishing industry, a theme which we will discuss next, there's been less analysis on the global ramifications of coronavirus and how it's impacted the publishing industry. While your national publishing industries have varying levels of integration with global publishing markets, I'd like to ask each of our panelists, what will the current pandemic mean for the global publishing industry? 
Maria Palanti, I'd like to start with you, if that's okay. Given your background in copyright, what intellectual property challenges does the rapid digital transformation of our industry in response to Corona present at the global level? Thank you, Badur. And uh, thank you for organizing this wonderful panel. I've never been to Moscow, but so I feel a little bit um, excited to be there virtually and a little bit saddened that I can't be there physically. So thank you also to our host country and to the Russian Book Union uh, and, and not just for this panel, but for giving us some of the greatest literature ever to be published in the world. Uh, I would say that um, we are so interconnected and what happens to one of us happens to all of us. And so on a good day, we get to float all boats and help each other and do what we love to do, which is to connect authors and readers uh, and students and teachers and uh, form our, our readers everywhere around the world. Um, but where there is a fragility, where, where one part of the ecosystem is fragile, we are all at risk. And so that's concerning, although I will preface it by saying that uh, we're a resilient industry. We have centuries and centuries of experience. Um, we're not going anywhere and people are reading more, not less. And we're also very forward thinking. It's built into our DNA as an industry. So I think in the long term, we'll see great leadership emerge and continue to guide us. But for now, and specifically to your question about intellectual property, um, intellectual property too is a very, um, technology neutral, flexible legal framework. Uh, it, it, it doesn't really matter um, how you're delivering content. However, it does require the business models to catch up. And I think that's what we're seeing now. What part of the industry as we know it will remain? Physical books are doing fine, um, but what part of the industry will change and adapt as publishers are at the table, say in education publishing, to transform and to um, deliver and to, to really to, to go to a place that we haven't been before, where more and more is online and there are these hybrid models of virtual and physical. I think um, unfortunately, wherever there is an opportunity, uh, you will see piracy and we are seeing that as well. So, you know, any chance to uh, during a moment of crisis to weaken, say, the copyright system. Regrettably, that seems to happen. And um, in the United States, we have a major case pending against the Internet Archive, for example, which while, um, while publishers were working with their partners to deliver content and to waive licenses and to create new business models and to be there for their partners, uh, took advantage of the crisis to, to uh, copy and to give away for free books to which they have no rights. So, you know, that, that's just a fact of intellectual property that will have those challenges. But overall, um, I believe in this industry, I believe in the staying power, and I think we'll be okay. We have to remember that we all um, need to support one another globally because at the end of the day, we're a global industry that matters. We matter to, to people everywhere. Yeah, thank you for that, uh, Maria. I'd love to um, hear more about that. And I, I'm happy that you say that we're a resilient industry because we are. I mean, we've we've been through tough times and hopefully we'll get through this uh, difficult time. Um, Joachim, I'd like to move on to you. Um, in Germany, I was intrigued to learn that 50% of book sales are made through bookstores. What does the pandemic me mean for small local booksellers selling globally? Sorry, I was on mute. Um, for, the, for the small booksellers, I must say the pandemic in the beginning after the lockdown looked terrible, absolutely terrible and devastating. Meanwhile, we have the interesting experience that the small and independent bookstores are less affected than the big chains um, because they are in strong contact with their customers and they found ways around that lockdown and um, made their own internet, um, e-commerce, website, 
or they had it before, but it wasn't very active. Um, so at the moment, it's probably too early to really judge that. But at the moment, it looks that um, the small and independent or medium-sized independent bookstores are not that much hit. Um, but the big chains have big problem depending on their digital part of the business. So it's, uh, as everywhere, it's a turmoil in the business um, right now in Germany. Um, if it comes to your question was about global publishing, and we are, of course, affected by the cancellation of so many fairs. Um, all of you know that Frankfurt Book Fair is probably the biggest, or it is the biggest book fair in the world, international book fair. And this year, Frankfurt won't be the Frankfurt we all know if it takes place at all. Um, so without a lot of international um, visitors and, and hardly any publishing houses who wants to exhibit. So um, yeah, we'll, we'll see what all that brings. Um, but at the moment, it's, it's still, still a big question mark. Um, and also about if we talk about global publishing, it's about connection and it's about meetings and uh, not only affairs, also business trips. Um, my business trip is is uh, was beginning of of the year, and usually I'm I'm living in a plane, so to say. So yes, we'll see. Um, I think we're all in the same boat, uh, Joachim, and we're all sort of watching to see what happens. But this uh, this comment about book fairs is something that's. Uh, perplexed a lot of us. And I want to move on to Laura, um, because I know a key strategy of Indonesia and in integrating its publishing industry in the global markets has been through the, the participation in book fairs like Frankfurt and London. So how do countries with emerging publishing markets like yours continue to make their mark on the global publishing world in the absence of all of the book fairs and these major literary events? Thank you, Bador. Um, it's been very difficult and tough for us because um, those publishers that uh, you know participate at the international trades are only a, a small portion of the number of publishers we have here, which are, I think there's about 20,000 more publishers in Indonesia and most of them are, uh, middle to small um, companies um, and majority of them have not really thought about international trades. Um, and so the, since the, the National Book Committee who was in charge of the promotion of Indonesian literature uh, uh, been stopped by the government so the, our initi initiative is to create something in Indonesia to accommodate all this international trace that has been happening. So I guess uh, we don't know yet the impact of this international trade, but our concern right now is to help and to nurture the industry within the local market. Uh, because it is very much impacted. Uh, like other people have been saying, uh, we also experience almost up to 80% drop in sales. And some publishers have actually closed down. Um, so I, am, I, I appreciate the call for action that IPA is doing because the points that you have written there uh, really resonates with the situation that we are facing here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I understand that situation very much. Um, in a lot of parts of the world, we are all facing many, many struggles. I'd like to move on to Vladimir. Um, over the past several years, Russia has been trying to boost international rights trading. How does the pandemic affect these plans and all of your other plans uh, for getting publishers recognized globally through the Moscow International Book Fair? Um, of course, it affects the fact that uh, very much uh, all our plans and uh, our intentions. You know, actually, the reports coming from different parts from Russia and different parts of the world on the situation in national publishing industries and uh, 
during the lockdown were similar to uh, communications coming from the front lines about losses, uh, closed bookshops or injuries uh, like canceled events, canceled book fairs, even the major book fairs, seminars, even the IPA Congress, and retreats of troops, uh, postponed publication of uh, headliners, of bestsellers, cancellation of uh, uh, a number of literary contents. Uh, as a result, we are, are witnessing massive uh, um, revenue losses in all the sectors of book industry uh, and attempts of almost all publishers to introduce uh, uh, preserving uh, strategies uh, with job cuts and complete concentration on survival uh, at the expense of development and uh, expansion. Uh, as there are less cultural events, there'll be less translations, less book exchanges, and uh, vividly damaged uh, purchasing habits of readers, not only in Russia, as, as I assume. On the other hand, any crisis uh, of that scale is the time to elaborate new strategies and taking into account social, educational, cultural importance of uh, books and our industry, which unites people representing national elites, uh, people of the highest intellectual and moral qualities, who are able to liberate recovery measures, uh, both for the national and um, uh, international book sector. I'm optimistic about the future uh, uh, of the global publishing industry. It will definitely be recovering Although it, uh, to, in my view, would uh, take another year or two, and it will be pretty much different from what it is uh, uh, right away, with the great impact of uh, digital transformation. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. Thank you, Vladimir, for that snapshot um, on what's happening in Russia. I'd like to now move on to Maria Hamrafor. Um, you led the digital transformation, I'm going to get it right now, of Academy Bokadeln as its CEO in calmer times. Mm -hmm. How do you guide the publishing industry and retail executives in navigating the current crisis? Uh, I think what we are seeing right now is really an acceleration of a development that has been going on for a number of years. And uh, if we ju just look at the Swedish market, it is already highly digitized. If we look at the, the value, uh, almost 50% of all uh, sales go through e-commerce uh, channels. And actually, if we, go, if we look at the volume side of the business, almost 50% of the market is now digital formats, primarily audiobooks, actually, which I think is an extraordinary high, uh, high number. So far, I think publishers have done fairly well. Uh, but what we see with this uh, migration to digital is really a higher pressure on both price and uh, also cost, obviously, for, for publishers. And if we look in, in just into the book selling part of the business, uh, we've been sort of adopting for almost 20 years to uh, a world where more business goes through digital channels. And a lot of the book selling actors also have online bookstores as a complement uh, to their physical uh, outlets, of course. And uh, during uh, the pandemic here, we have really seen a further acceleration of uh, the digital development and overall book sales. Sales, If we look at physical books or, or book selling, uh, the overall number has actually not declined during the pandemic, but physical booksellers have lost almost 30% of their sales. But that has been largely picked up by the online channel. So, and we do believe that a lot of customers will probably continue to buy online after the pandemic, uh, even though we haven't had uh, such a bad situation in, in our country as we haven't had a complete lockdown. The business, the society has been open, but people have been asked to, to work from home uh, rather than, you know, go to their, their usual offices and so on. And it's also quite, quite interesting because you see a very different picture 
sort of from bookstore to bookstore. A number of them are struggling. Some are even having higher sales because uh, bookstore customers are typically very, very loyal indeed. So they have bought more, bigger piles of books from their stores. And we also see that uh, a lot of uh, uh, books, not, not the paperback, but the hardback books, have actually that, that has grown because people are not traveling as much as you know we don't travel any one of us so we don't buy paperbacks but we stay at home and then we really want the hardcover books instead so a lot of quite interesting things are, are happening here in the market but I think really one of the biggest impacts and the most almost touching things is the loyalty between readers and uh, booksellers and also publishers I'd say. That's very interesting. Thank you for sharing that, Maria. And I mean, I know all of you gave us sort of like a snapshot of what's happening in your parts of the world. I'd like to now go deeper on the experience on the ground for publishers and other stakeholders in the publishing ecosystem in your home countries. What are the impacts of coronavirus pandemic on your national publishing ecosystems? We talked a little bit about sales. Have the sales been affected significantly? And what subsectors of the publishing ecosystems have been hit the hardest and how long do you expect the market to be affected so um, I'll, I'll start with Oleg um, Oleg estimates are that the domestic publisher revenues are down 75% in Russia with similar decline revenues for booksellers are these numbers accurate and how long do you think it will take to recover Да, действительно, мы несколько месяцев имели такие цифры. Индустрия сильно упала в период май, апрель, март. И с учетом того, что практически все книжные магазины были закрыты, а у нас это основной канал продаж, но пострадали не только розничные книжные магазины, пострадали и другие каналы продаж, в том числе FMCG сети, которые торгуют книгами и рост продаж в интернет-канале, который действительно был в это время, игроки интернет, работающие на интернет, особенно глобальные игроки, такие как Озон, Wildberries, увеличили свои продажи на 40-50%, но это не компенсировало тех доходов, которые выпали за это время, и в целом потери были на уровне 60-70%, в течение второго квартала, трех месяцев, с марта по июнь. С июля ситуация немножко начала выправляться, книжные магазины начали открываться, и на сегодняшний день мы имеем а, ситуацию, когда все магазины практически открыты, и люди постепенно возвращаются. Надеемся, что процесс восстановления он пойдет. Последние данные вот, конца августа внушают определенные оптимизм. Ну и более того, вот Московская международная книжная ярмарка, она показывает достаточно большой интерес читателей к книгам, в том числе к бумажным книгам. И те процессы, которые шли в вот последнее время, мы надеемся, что процесс восстановления он все-таки будет идти достаточно динамично и к концу года продажи восстановятся. Хотя общие продажи по сравнению с прошлым годом просядут процентов на 15-17. Ну, а с учетом того, что мы рассчитывали, что в этом году рынок вырастет процентов на 5-7, ну, где-то 20, не менее 20 процентов от ожидаемых продаж рынок потеряет. Ну, вот такие вот тренды в России. Спасибо. Great. Thank you for that, Oleg. I'll just um, I'll just summarize your comments because uh, one of our channels is not uh, catching the interpretation. So uh, some of our uh, listeners would want to hear exactly what's happening in Russia. So you mentioned there is a big drop from March to May. Uh, bookstores closed, online sales uh, uh, dropped. However, there was a growth in ebook sales and uh, there was a drop in 60% of book sales in Russia during the second quarter of this year. And by July, it was looking a little bit better when bookshops reopened again and 
business as usual. Um, and hopefully there'll be a, a better recovery towards the end of the year. And you are very optimistic that um, everything will be back uh, even better than normal by the end of this year uh, with the Moscow International Book Fair happening right now. So thank you for that summary, Oleg. I hope I didn't miss anything. Uh, uh, may, uh, may yes. just add one thing that uh, although we are optimistic, uh, we are expecting 20% uh, decline by the end of the year. And uh, one more major thing, the, the e-commerce and uh, 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 electronic books uh, did not compensate the losses. Although, because Russia is the country which has 60-65% uh, uh, sales through the bookshops. And it's uh, uh, the figures that we are, uh, we are having here. So, uh, that's why uh, internet sales uh, did not compensate uh, the losses. Mm -hmm. And uh, taking into account the, the dynamics, was a positive dynamic of the last month, we're expecting that we'll be restoring uh, during the first month of, uh, uh, of uh, I mean, in September, October, November, we will we'll try to restore what we, uh, what we had uh, last year compared to, 19, to uh, 20, 2019, but uh, still, uh, we are expecting that 20% loss by the end of the year. Okay, thank you for that clarification, Vladimir. And we will all be watching what happens by the end of this year. Um, hopefully, uh, things will get better for publishing industry worldwide. I want to move on to Joachim. Um, you spoke a little bit about the what's happening in Germany. Um, I have some figures here that the German Publishers and Booksellers Association estimated losses due to coronavirus at $543 million in April. What are the most up-to-date figures and has there been a recovery plan in Germany? Yeah, these were the figures of April. And in general, I would say the German book market is a pretty stable market. And of course, Corona has, has caused a big turmoil. Um, so we are mainly affected during the uh, months of lockdown or the weeks of lockdown, um, from April, March and April. Um, thereafter, I must say it was surprisingly fast that the revenues in the bookstores went back to a more or less normal level. You can't say that for all, you can't say that for all regions, and you can't say that for all sizes of different stores. But in general, the total book market from um, beginning of the year accumulated is about um, five five percent below previous year, which to me is a surprising figure. So we started with two good months and then we had a catastrophe. But even during the catastrophe, it was not that the revenue went down by 80%. They did for certain customers. But um, as, as Maria told that for Sweden, e-commerce, for example, has increased a lot during that time. And they were hardly able to deliver all the books that were ordered. So, and then we have this huge differences between the different publishing sectors. You've talked about that a bit, um, Bodur. Um, if, if you're a publisher for travel literature, you're hardly able to smile these days. Um, they went down by more than 80% during the lockdown phase, and, um, but still they are 60, 40, 50% um, below previous year. Um, I'm in, we are the market leading publishing house for children publishing. We had 11 million uh, children at home um, and there was a bigger need for books. So we are pretty, pretty okay, I would say. Um, and there are differences in companies again. Um, my family's company um, has a kindergarten distribution company as, as the main distribution channel for publishing. And if the kindergarten are closed, the business goes down to zero. So everybody um, in the market is affected differently, I would say. Um, 
and also the shift to digital. Of course, um, there is a big shift to digital. The e-commerce channels, including download and physical e-commerce, they usually um, are around a third of the market here in Germany. Now, during the lockdown, they went down away up to 43%, and still they are after the lockdown has finished they still are um, around 40%. So probably there will be some, some remaining shifts after, after this crisis, if there's ever a real after. <laughs> Yes, we will. We will wait and see what happens, and uh, hopefully, uh, by the last quarter of 2020, we'll see an increase in sales worldwide. And we're all got our fingers crossed for that. Laura, as the largest book producer in Southeast Asia, has the Corona slowed down? Slowed down led to subregional impact beyond Indonesia. So um, what happened in Indonesia was. Uh, we only had our first COVID case on the 2nd of March. So before then, uh, unfortunately, our government was in denial. <laughs> they thought Corona won't hit us. But uh, following after the first um, two cases, which happened at the same time on the 2nd of March, uh, people went on panic mode. Uh, that's when you saw a lot of people, you know, stocking up on things. And the bookstore uh, dropped by 50% from the sales before the pandemic. And then it dropped again by 80% in April and then dropped and increased a little bit. It dropped by 70% in May. And then we saw an increase after the lockdown was removed in June and July. Um, in July was the best month uh, for sales from bookstores. Uh, we had only a 40% drop. But then something, hap something weird happened in August, the moment where everyone is a little bit more relaxed than uh, before. Uh, the sales uh, at the bookstores um, dropped from the month before. Um, I think people uh, spend more of their uh, disposable income on other activities. So that's unfortunate, uh, but the increase in sales through e-commerce have not really uh, replaced the drop from the books bookstores, uh, and the increase in e-books also have not really replaced um, the the drop. Uh, so from the publishing side, uh, we think uh, the market will recover next year, but because I also have a printing house, uh, we have uh, tried to print other things, not books, <laughs> um, like packagings, or uh, we're hoping for the election coming up in September to, to print for election materials. And But before bookstores, I think the printing house is affected uh, mostly uh, here. Um, but in terms of the author productivity, um, we are we're not seeing any drop in the manuscript we receive because I think more and more people have more leisure time to uh, to write or things like that. Yeah, but in compared to the Southeast Asian region, I think the number of COVID cases here in Indonesia is uh, one of the worst. Mm -hmm. But the, the yeah. people don't think so. <laughs> Well, it's interesting that you say it's time to get creative and really think out of the box in, in order to stay afloat. I think that's a really good strategy for a lot of publishers is really to find ways to manage this uh, you know, situation as it is now. So in many countries, um, the corona pandemic has still not subsided, uh, but initial signs of its deep impact on the industry have begun to manifest. So we see small publishers struggling. We see bookshop sales slowing down. Some of them have migrated online. Uh, some titles have been delayed and major publishing industry events canceled. So over the long term, the coronavirus pandemic could lead to an acceleration of a range of digitization, reading, purchasing trends that will require the publishing industry to adapt. 
And how has this crisis impacted publishers and industry players at the firm level? I would like to ask the, the panelists um, this question, looking at it from a broader industry-wide perspective uh, on reading and purchasing habits. So has the pandemic accelerated longer term trends in how publishing firms are run? What publishing ecosystem players would you say have been the most affected in the long run? And is there now a stronger preference for digital formats? And last but not least, are there any winners from the pandemic? I'd like to direct this question first to Maria Hammerforce. Uh, that, that's a big, uh, that's really a big question. I think what we are seeing uh, now in our market is that certain genres within literature are doing better than others. And it's actually really the, the literary fiction and the translated fiction that is struggling on a publisher's level. And a lot of that is because uh, as, as booksellers are, are struggling, they don't really have an opportunity to reach out to the market. So there is a, a risk, and I know that our Publishers Association are really worried about that, that we will lose a number of probably the smaller publishers that has this sort of area of, of focus for the business. And also the ones who have already not invested in digital will have a, a much more challenging time uh, to come and I think overall whether you whatever you do in the business whether you're a bookseller or whether you are a publisher I think we will see trends of uh, uh, more consolidation as a result of this because you, you if you su suffer with your sales your your profits are on, on under pressure but you will also need to make investments that are costly to, to really be re resilient in the long term I think we will probably see a, a trend for more consolidation in our in our industry, uh, both on the national level and on the international level. Mm, thank you. And Maria Palante, are there any success stories uh, coming from the United States after this pandemic? Well, the, the pandemic itself has not been a success story, as I'm sure you've all read. In the United States, it's still very much a, a huge threat and not yet under control. But um, it's an interesting question, Bajor. I, you know, at the very beginning, uh, listening to my colleagues in, in March, we were, uh, we are both in business and in education regulated by the 50 states, not by the national government. And so, at AAP, uh, at the association, we immediately pivoted to the business lockdowns that were happening, state by state, community by community, to ensure that publishing was covered as a, an essential, um, essential business, really meaning that you don't want to deprive people of reading during a crisis or uh, you know, delay their access to, to books. Uh, whether that's we're speaking about kids or whether we're speaking about citizens who want access to political books uh, or information. So that, you know, that was very clear very quickly, just the, the, the absolute criticality of the publishing business. And so we, we were able to work uh, very effectively at the state level to ensure that warehouses were open. I mean, you you, it, it was sort of a walk backwards through the ecosystem and business chain to educate policymakers about the fact that um, you know, publishers working remotely didn't mean that there weren't actual physical books that needed to be delivered, which means warehouses have to be open. It means trucking has to be allowed. It means delivery has to be permitted. Um, but then there was a certain point where uh, that became very complicated. And as everybody has already opined, that happened to be with the bookstores. And so what I would say is that the, I thought the power and the in a crisis, the power and the weaknesses both emerge in the framework, the legal framework and the business framework, meaning that some of the crisis was related to systemic challenges that were beginning to exacerbate anyway. And so for us, um, in looking at bookstores really struggling and small publishers, those are the two areas where I think we were, we were most hit. And some I think will not survive. Um, I think it, it's financially quite challenging. And others really needed their communities to rally to make sure that people 
knew that in terms of purchasing choices that the community bookstore was an option. And so we did quite a lot of work working with our Authors Guild and our Booksellers Association to promote our bookstores and to remind consumers that they, they should want them to survive. So, but what was going on in the background? What was going on in the background is that we have dominant uh, firms based in the US that control a lot of our e-commerce and the book industry, uh, Amazon in particular. So Amazon's a super important partner for our publishing community, but they have uh, an absolutely outsized unhealthy share of the marketplace. Uh, so how, how did that happen? Why did that happen? You know, our Congress is investigating that. We have different agencies looking at whether that is um, now reached a point where it, it will hurt the rest of the ecosystem and whether that's unhealthy, both for the democratic state, but also for these other small businesses and for the Amazons of tomorrow, the next generation of innovative companies. The answer to which is I think a yes to all of those questions. So we're very much engaged in that. But what it's meant is that where Amazon may have had say 50% of the uh, distribution market, again, for US publishing houses, they, they, it's probably closer to 80%. And so on the one hand, um, they were able to deliver, but you have to work backwards and say, but why weren't others able to deliver? What's going on there? And there are lots of things to unpack. Printing was an issue. Uh, there's a delay in printing the, the printing supply chain, that's a problem for publishers. But you know, publishers were able to go remote. So the actual publishing house, I thought, you know, not just in the higher education sector where they've long been digitally focused, but and remotely um, friendly, remote telework friendly. I thought that um, it was remarkable to see these big New York publishing houses suddenly have their entire workforce operating remotely. And that's interesting because, you know, it, it, it creates questions about will the, will the talent pool now be more global for these houses? Will you need the same kind of real estate? So I think, I think there it's been pretty exciting to watch. Um, There's some things that are lost. There's some thought leadership meetings, I think, that are lost. I know just for my own employees, uh, the heads down desk work is not a problem, but the thought leadership and creativity and the really strategic uh, conversations are very difficult if you don't see one another more than an hour a day on Zoom. So um, I would say, you know, pluses like everybody else, people are listening to audio formats, maybe for the first time. You know, maybe during the pandemic, they read eBooks for the first time. <clears throat> eBooks in the US have long been declining. They went up, there was a spike. Audiobooks have long been increasing and they went up even more. Uh, you know, overall, we have to wait and see what the third quarter looks like before we'll really know what's happening economically. But I think everybody will remember what they were reading, who they were with. You know, this is just one of those moments. And so I go back to publishing is resilient, but there are some systemic challenges that, that showed themselves to us. And we have to rectify those uh, because you can't have you can't have one company that has a trucking infrastructure and a warehouse infrastructure and a delivery in infrastructure that um, compromises the rest of the ecosystem. Again, we're, you know, where there, where there is um, fragility in one part of the ecosystem, it affects everybody and affects the whole chain. Very interesting, uh, Maria, and I, I completely uh, agree with how the pandemic has sort of like magnified all the cracks in our industry yeah. mm -hmm. a lot more and showed us what doesn't work and what we need to change. And it's really an opportunity, as you mentioned, for new innovative uh, ideas to come through. Uh, I'd like to move on to Oleg now um, to give us a little bit of a, an idea on, you know, if there were any long term trends in the Russian book market or any new trends that you've seen coming out of this pandemic and how the, the pandemic has affected these reading trends or um, uh, sort of opened the door for new trends to come in. Ну вот я согласен с коллегами, что действительно пандемия, она ускорила те тренды, которые мы видели на протяжении предыдущих лет. 
Это в первую очередь тренд по дедитализации процессов. И я бы тут отметил три группы направлений. Первое – это изменение работы в издательствах, внутри издательства, работа в удаленном режиме, в том числе и дискуссии, совещания по Zoom, подготовка книг вне офиса. И эти процессы стали действительно другими. У нас был опыт работы издательства «Ман Иванов Фарбер», который 15 лет успешно работая на рынке, работает без офиса. И в таком режиме издательство и все остальные работали на протяжении трех месяцев. И это существенно поменяло наше представление о возможностях дистанционной работы. Второй тренд – это онлайн-коммуникации с читателями. Мы видим сегодня их значимость и значимость создания медиаконтента, информирующего о книгах. И сегодня менеджер проекта, редактор должен думать не только о выпуске книги в бумажном формате, но думать о трех форматах – бумажный, электронный и аудиоформат, плюс медиаконтент, сопровождающий издания, коммуникации с читателями, поддерживая проект издания и продажи книг. Ну и третий, третий тренд – это продажи, действительно, рост доли и коммерс, и диджитал контента в продажах. Сейчас он у нас уже почти 50%, если смотреть вместе онлайн-продажи бумажных книг и продажи электронных книг. Я думаю, с восстановлением книжных магазинов на какое-то время эта доля откатится, но в целом тренд того, что интернет-продажи – это основной канал, самый мощный канал, на который надо ориентироваться, с которым надо работать, он сохранится. При этом я хотел бы отметить, что, на мой взгляд, книжная индустрия не может без традиционных книжных магазинов, и их восстановление – это основной вызов, для нас, и я считаю, что издатели должны помочь им восстановиться и помочь им развить свои продажи, вернуть те продажи, которые были до пандемии, и это залог нашего долгосрочного благополучия. Спасибо. Thank you, Oleg. I'll just quickly do a quick translation for one of our channels that does not have the interpretation. So you mentioned that the pandemic accelerated trends in digitization and specifically in three key areas. The first is the how we work. So changes uh, within the publishing houses, people were working from home, meetings, the structure of meetings have changed. Um, so that has created a new trend in publishing houses in Russia. The second is online communication with readers, new trend coming there through other formats like e-books and audio books and different ways of communicating with your readers. And lastly, uh, the growth of e-commerce um, and digital contact has spiked up significantly during the pandemic, around 50% more than, than the usual. And uh, you've seen a growth in the e-book market uh, significantly in Russia. I hope this is a, an adequate translation of uh, your summary. Uh, if I missed anything, please let me know. No, it's okay. I just uh, last about traditional book store that necessary to support support bookstore and help them to recover their sales. In okay, future. it's a fundamental important to us. Okay, thank you for that uh, addition. I'm sorry I didn't get that in the translation, but uh, this gives us a, a good idea of what's happening in Russia at the moment. And um, I'd like to now ask Joachim regarding bookstores and how they're adapting in Germany. Uh, approximately 15, 50% of retail, retail book sales are through bricks and mortar uh, bookstores. 
Uh, so usually bookstores are the primary sales channel uh, for, for Germany, I would say, uh, from the statistic. How are bookstores coping with the pandemic right now in terms of purchasing habits? Uh, do you see more online purchasing? And are the larger chains handling the crisis better than the independent bookstores? And how do you see this playing out in the future? I know you mentioned a little bit of, of this uh, previously when you spoke, but give us a bit more of an idea of how you see this playing out in the future. Do you think this is a trend or do you, that it's going to stay uh, uh, for, for the future? Or do you think this is a temporary situation that we're witnessing right now? I think there's a difference between the trend and the temporary situation. So it's surprisingly, it's pretty similar. Like in, in Russia, um, I, I could agree on many things. Um, my, the Russian speaker said before, um, what, what it's interesting is that I see Corona is more an accelerator of many different developments. They were there before the crisis um, already. The shift to e-commerce is slower in Germany than in other countries, especially um, than in the US. So yes, up to now, we had a um, market share of bookstores of about 55%. Um, now it's down below 50 during the crisis, 45% perhaps. You're still there? Yes, we can hear you. Yes. Please okay. go on. I, I had a okay. Um, now it's it's down to forty five percent, and um, probably that won't come back as it was. Your question regarding the independent versus the chains. Um, at the moment, the chains are are harder hit um, because of they they have they usually are in big malls, um, which are struggling. Um, they have big stores, a lot of staff um, versus the small and independent stores where the owner serve himself and um, the personal costs are different. So at the moment they are struggling. Um, they are shift they are it's easier for them to shift um, some of the revenue to digital sales channels. All of them have a professional e-commerce um, system as well. But I think they will recover um, or they will die. Probably there will be a consolidation during the next, we'll see it during the next 12 months. Also with the bigger chains, um, that's at least a risk I see. Um, the biggest chain, Talia, with, with more, than, more than 400 stores, is, is managing the crisis pretty well, I must say. We are in close contact with all our customers which is perhaps also an advantage of, of the whole crisis that even if you can't meet personally, I think you're very often in closer contact than before also with international customers or for me with China, for example, for my colleagues with China, in China um, because the communication has changed. And that's perhaps something you haven't asked for that, but I, I, I'm a terrible, we know each other for a while, I'm a terrible optimist and I, I strongly believe that there will be lots of good things we take out of that, of that crisis, especially in, in office work. Um, the possibility to be much more, yeah, to work remote, um, to, be, to be free to employ people, even if they are not in the city um, where your office is. Um, all these kind of, of, of new habits um, and new communication tools and the usage of uh, a real usage, they were there before, but for example, that panel, it's for us, it, it's pretty, pretty normal that it's virtual. A few, a few months ago, all of us would say, um, yeah, of course I come to Moscow and everybody would love to come there. So I think um, the way of working, the way of work, um, has changed a lot and will continue to change. And it's an accelerator, um, the coronavirus. And we will have also, as an interesting employer, we will have a lot of benefits also um, after we, we have managed the main crisis. 
Mm -hmm. Thank you, Joachim. It's definitely made us more efficient in our work, I, I believe, because we've had we have um, a limited, you know, uh, number of hours in the day to get things done. So we get them done and we find ways to get them done. So I think it's definitely opened up uh, more channels of communication for people across the world as well. And with Zoom now, it's easy to um, you know, have a meeting with someone, as you mentioned, in China. So I know we have a lot of people watching us on YouTube and I just want to encourage anybody there to uh, ask us any questions. We'll be taking questions at the end of this, uh, towards the end of this session. Uh, and so we'd love to hear your questions. So please um, put them down um, on the YouTube channel or wherever you're watching us and they'll be sent to the group here and we'll, we'll be happy to answer them. Uh, in the meantime, I, I want to turn my attention um, right now to uh, Sweden and Maria. Could you give us an idea of um, what's happening in terms of bricks and mortar bookstores? Uh, I believe that the decline there was about 24%. I know you mentioned a little bit about that previously. Uh, could you tell us a little bit more about how book uh, uh, stores and large chains are handling this crisis? Are they doing it better than the smaller independent bookstores? And do you think this has got, got a big impact in terms of digital formats taking over? Uh, yes, uh, talking about small versus large, I think that the, it really here depends on uh, location rather than size. So where the store is located is really the, the important thing. If a store is located in an area in a city center that has been deserted during the pandemic, then obviously that's, that's very challenging from a, a sales perspective. Whereas if you have a, a store in more of a suburban area or more of a holiday area, you may have actually had increased sales uh, during the pandemic. Uh, so I think some are suffering harder than, than others. And I think we will probably see a number of closures as a result of this uh, pandemic, but probably they would be in a difficult situation, you know, in the long term anyhow, I, I, I expect that. Um, here I'd say that, that we still have the most important time of the year ahead of us, and that's the Christmas season in, in uh, Sweden, 20% of all bookstore sales happen in December. So if people are still not going to go shopping the way they use, uh, they used to, that will probably be a very you know, challenging uh, uh, end of this year that will have uh, consequences in the long term. So I think we still have really what's, what would be very delicate to manage. We have that period uh, ahead of us. And I think what we have also seen here is, an, uh, is that loyalty between customers and booksellers is really extremely important. And I think a lot of the booksellers have developed new ways to keeping uh, in touch with their customers during the pandemic, working more on social media, for instance, home delivery, a lot of things to keep the business going and keep those relationships going. And uh, that's really what we are about, I think. Mm, that's very interesting. And Laura, what's the situation like um, in Indonesia in terms of bookstores? Do you see this um, uh, change or this difference between the larger bookstores and the smaller independent booksellers? Uh, do you see a trend moving towards digital publishing? Yeah, uh, majority of the bookstores here are located in the cities and the uh, majority of COVID cases are happening in the cities. Uh, so it's been difficult to some bookstores and I, this is just my judgment, but I expect uh, there's gonna be a lot less bookstores in the near future. Um, publishers are very well, I guess, very well adapted to the technology. Uh, our, uh, the editorial team are uh, very quick to to convert everything online, and so is the sales. Uh, you know, putting books on the e-commerce market. So I think in the near future we are becoming so accustomed to ordering things online. 
I haven't been to the grocery stores in the last six months. I mean, I, it's just a, has become uh, very uh, convenient to, 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 to me personally. But uh, out of all the speakers here, uh, I'm from an emerging market. So uh, the situation is a bit tougher than uh, uh, your countries probably because uh, where most people uh, have lost their uh, job or lost uh, a lot of their income uh, books are not in the in the top of the mind they uh, they care more about providing food and providing all the necessities in the household and uh, that's why a lot of stimulus packages from the government are directed to the micro uh, economies um, i think our government is giving out uh, up to 100 million US dollars just to help these um, micro economies uh, to survive. Um, and hopefully publishing is part of the... <laughs> thank you, Laura. Um, thank you, Laura, for giving us that uh, update. And uh, I know there's a dog barking in the background, so <laughs> thanks for putting it on mute. Um, I, I just want to uh, ask a question from one of our uh, audience members on YouTube, uh, Sharif Bakr, who is a publisher from Egypt, and he's a very active member with us in IPA. And he's asking, how do you see the future of book fairs? And I open this question to all of you here on the panel today. What, are the, what is the future of book fairs? What will book fairs look like? given the situation right now. Yes, Maria, go ahead. Yeah, uh, here we have in, in Gothenburg in, in Sweden, we have a book fair that typically attracts around 100,000 people. So it's really a big, big event. And uh, it's happening in the end of September. And this year they have uh, gone digital. So it's the book fair play this year. So they will have lots of seminars and activities going on uh, online, uh, open to anyone to watch real time or afterwards. And I think in the beginning, I think people, a lot of people were just really concerned, but I think that, that this is also a new development that would probably be quite attractive for a lot, a lot of people, even though the entire industry will of course miss seeing each other. Uh, but I think it's interesting that they have been able to, in a very short time, just think through everything in a different way and come up with an interesting program. So do you think this is um, going to remain uh, as a trend now? Will we see hybrid book fairs in the future once you know this pandemic is over? Or do you think uh, we will go back to our traditional book fairs? I, I think we will probably have a, have a hybrid. I think uh, this is also an opportunity to open it up for more people. You don't have to travel uh, to that specific city, but you can still enjoy the, the content or some of the content and then you can do it whenever you want. Mm -hmm. so I think it's really, it should be quite a good hybrid if, if you get it right. Yeah. Anybody else have any comments or uh, yeah. ideas yeah. we want to add? Yes, Joachim. Yeah, coming from Germany, of course, we are discussing a lot about book fairs in the future and what's the right formats for book fairs um, organizing as our as our association, the Börsenverein, is organizing the biggest book fair in the world. I'm totally convinced there will be, again, book fairs. So I think we have to differ between trade book fairs and uh, book fairs for readers. Um, the event Maria just mentioned um, is a book fair for readers, as we have it here as well in big formats um, probably it will take a while until they come back in that dimension as we are used to it and i strongly believe there will be hybrid formats for these kinds of book fairs for the trade book fairs i don't know how you see that but i think it's very important to meet um, people physically again especially if you meet them for the first time it's pretty easy if you have a good contact, but if you want to build trust, if you want to make big business, if you're talking about acquisitions in the beginning, everything, it's a lot about the personal contact. And I strongly believe the need for that will in that digital world not be much smaller. Perhaps it even becomes more important. So I think 
as as soon as the as the uh, the, the status of the virus and worldwide globally um, makes it possible and um, we will have a need for meeting in person again and there will be book fairs in london there will be a book fair in frankfurt and other international book fairs um, for for meetings for business meetings between publishing houses especially if they are not in a already in a close contact for selling foreign rights and so on that's my view on that, or perhaps my hope on that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Joachim. Anybody else want to? Yes, Vladimir, go ahead. Well, we just opened the Moscow Book Fair uh, yesterday, and we negotiated for a while with our medical authorities about uh, the number of people who be allowed to visit it. So uh, the figure is uh, 20,000 a day, so we'll be getting 100,000 uh, visitors. Uh, except professionals. Uh, what I feel uh, staying the whole day yesterday at the book fair is that uh, many people are still scared and they are uh, trying to enter but with all the precautions uh, of uh, our current time. Uh, but the professionals, I mean all the B2B formats, formats are you know, full with the, the professionals. Because people are after the lockdown, just want to see each other and uh, to talk freely uh, to each other. So um, half of the half of the formats are going um, online. Uh, so my 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 idea is that this hybrid of uh, online and offline will still continue to be effective for a while. Uh, but still, you know, uh, uh, people to people uh, connection. Uh, which is so vital for, for our industry, and it will remain. Uh, so the book fairs will still have uh, their traditional format. Thank you. Thank you, Vladimir. Any other comments? Maria or Laura, do you want to jump in with any comments on that? Um, well, uh, yeah, go ahead, I, Laura. I, um, I'm or uh, we're organizing an event uh, to facilitate in um, you know the international trade in November, and um, even though we cannot uh, you know see face to face, but I think the the relationship that we've built with uh, some publishers uh, through international book fairs um, will have to be maintained through even even through digital uh, fairs. Um, so I guess I know uh, a lot of people said uh, so the digital meetings, digital that, digital this, it's uh, too, too overwhelming. But I think uh, it's important for our industry to survive uh, is to have these dialogues um, uh, because those, that relationship can easily vanish if we don't continue to uh, to to meet uh, digitally that's very true thank you laura maria do you want to add anything sure i think uh i think as vladimir said the moscow book fair will be very instructive for a lot of us uh to see to see how that goes and um you know basically how it helps the industry, but also what the health risks might be after the fact uh, as they reveal themselves. I worry mostly, you know, as a forward thinking industry, part of that calculus is that we look to the future generation of publishing. We have a responsibility, all of us, to look to those that will succeed us. And I think sort of what is happening here is happening in business more broadly. Many of us know each other already because we met in person you know, multiple times or no, no friends who know friends who know colleagues. And those meetings are indispensable to our ability to carry out business now. I worry mainly about the younger generation of publishing uh, and, and how they come into it, whether they find it a sustainable career in this kind of strange environment. And uh, I think we should think about that uh, as leaders in the industry. Um, and I think it does sort of point to the fact that we have to meet in person and we have to have that excitement and energy that comes from personal mentorships and opportunities and 
um, you know, meetings with actually more than one or two people and not in two dimensional form. Uh, and yes. Bedora, I have a policy comment um, uh, if we if, if and when you pivot back to to policy unrelated to this question. <laughs> oh, OK, go ahead, Maria. The, the floor is yours. Give oh, us your comment. Well, thank you. I just uh, am reflecting on all of the comments of um, of this esteemed panel, and I, I have a policy background, as you know, and I think that you know, one of the fundamental truths is that we don't control the entire ecosystem, right? We don't control funding. We don't control what the universities are going to do, what the pre-K through 12 schools are going to do, if bookstores are going to survive. And so that points to policy participation. It's really critical uh, and this goes to IPA's role in all of the member associations that IPA uh, helps to sustain and give guidance to, and 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 we in return do the same uh, back to IPA. I think, you know, for example, we haven't spoken about scholarly publishing. Scholarly publishers were so incredible in the early days of the virus, in terms of putting out for free any literature research that had been published by them around the world globally uh, to scientists, doctors, and policymakers, and frankly, to the public. Um, publishers are just terrific corporate citizens. I mean, they, they, it's just a wonderful industry in that regard. But you have to sit, sit, you know, step back and say, what if, where did the literature come from? How did that ecosystem get us to the point where we had research for people to share in the first place? And how do we sustain that business model? And so then we look at the, the customers of, of professional and scholarly publishers and they're trying to figure out their funding models. Um, university presses often publish things that no commercial press will publish. We can't do without university publishers. We have to have that list of titles that they invest in um, or we will be poorer for it. Higher education, they have a great leadership story to tell. They have long been focused on affordability models, online subscriptions, uh, access, uh, innovative models, apps, all kinds of exciting tools. But universities at least in the US are very expensive and customers are looking to them and saying, why am I paying the same amount of money for tuition for an online class uh, as I was for my child to go to a university and engage fully and robustly. And then you look at that system and say, but we need to have the great faculty. You can't, you can't cut the budget to the bone. Uh, but you don't, what you don't want is for them to cut, begin to cut publishing uh, or published works or libraries or uh, libraries as customers. And you need to sustain the whole ecosystem for the good of everybody. For pre-K-12, it's a very momentous time. Um, I believe that hybrid and distance learning will be part of pre-K-12, but not the whole package. Uh, but there the key is that the funding and adoption of curricula and educational resources is very complicated. And at least in the US is done at the state and local level. And so it's really, really important that publishers are at the table um, to be partners in what, what that should look like. And I think pre-K-12 publishers have always been partners because their objectives tend to be equity and student empowerment. You know, they, they really look at the whole 360 model, the teacher, the student, the parents. There's a lot of training that has to be done in the digital environment. And so that requires um, support, uh, whether in, in the you know, guise of stimulus money or just long-term structural changes to how budgets are adopted. So, you know, those are the kinds of things that we look at at AAP and how to help sustain the whole structure. But in this moment where we're so proud of, of what publishers do and the mission of publishing and the, the importance and criticality of it, um, we have to be aware of where all the tentacles are and how we support our other partners um, will affect us. 
Thank you, Maria. I mean, I was nodding my head throughout uh, while you were speaking because I, I strongly believe that as publishers, we we're very good at speaking to each other, but we're not very good at speaking to other people uh, who work in the publishing industry value chain. And, you know, we are just one peg in this value chain. And it's very important for us to communicate with each other and find a strategy that will help all of us in the long term. And as many of you know, the IPA is, is in the process of reaching out to our colleagues and other international org organizations and publishing trade associations to put together a working group to develop an action plan for supporting the recovery of the global publishing ecosystem. So that's something that we're working on in I IPA and um, would love to have all of you involved in giving your feedback on that. So we have about 10 minutes left, um, and I just want to ask um, the last question, which is about government support for the publishing industry. And uh, in April, IPA was a signatory to an open letter to governments highlighting the need for targeted stimulus programs for the publishing ecosystem. There was an emphasis on a need to support entire ecosystems, including authors, editors, distributors, booksellers, printers, book fairs, and collective management organizations. In particular, there's a real need for us to come together as an industry to develop specific asks of governments for targeted stimulus programs. I'd like to ask the panelists today, has your government offered a stimulus program, financial assistance, or other industry support to the publishing industry? And if so, which were the most impactful? which present possible replicable best practices for other governments and how can publishing ecosystem institutions work together to recover. I'd like to start with Joachim because I know Germany announced a staggering 50 billion euro aid package for the creative and cultural sectors. What can we learn from this Joachim? Well, it's not a 50 billion cultural package, unfortunately, and not a 50 billion publishing package. But um, the German state is very, was very active and still is very active um, with stimulus um, programs, um, also for the creative industry, not only for publishing. We have a lowered VAT for, for half a year, for the second half of the year, this year which helps us a lot, um, as well the, the retailers as, as the publishers, because we have that system of fixed prices, so that doesn't go to the consumer in our industry. It stays half at the publisher side, half at the retailer side, so that was a big help. Um, we have concrete help, for example, for the book fair, which of course loses the, the whole business, um, and that's a big part of our association, so that brings our association the burden fine in danger. Um, we have direct credits to publishers, uh, to booksellers, um, partly pay, uh, without payback, partly they are real credits. So there was a lot and probably there still is something to come. So the German, German government and the, the state government, different uh, governments of uh, different states are very active and we are very grateful how, how good in total, of course, you always can criticize something. And of course, you want more and more. But in total, I would say Germany is managing the crisis very, very well. And I'm very grateful for that. Thank you, Joachim. Um, we have about uh, seven minutes left. So I'm going to go through all of the panelists and ask them to answer this question, but in a condensed and short uh, answer if possible. Maria Hammerforce, what do you think uh, in terms of any government stimulus packages coming to uh, Sweden? In my research, I found that Sweden introduced 45 million euro relief package, if I'm not mistaken, for the cultural sector. Has this reached the publishing sector? Uh, mm, I'd say not, not a lot of it. Uh, a lot of actually very little of it, I'd say. Uh, there has been some increased support to publishers uh, for publishing cer certain titles, but so far, and also some money going uh, to the authors, the Authors Guild to distribute among authors, but primarily government has supported uh, those who have had to cancel events and uh, we haven't had nothing coming uh, the way to booksellers, for instance, even though we really try to argue for that. 
So I'd say so far quite limited. And of course, uh, the book, book industry can take advantage of some of the general uh, support that government has given. But uh, I'd say we haven't really seen so much that we are impressed so far. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, what about you, Laura? In Indonesia, I, I read that there was $742 million committed to tourism and creative sector stimulus package. Has any of this reached publishers? No, unfortunately not. I think uh, their biggest concern, because it's under one ministry, their biggest concern is for the tourism side. But uh, out of all the things that we've asked the government, um, I wish that the where the e-commerce market is trending, like um, more and more uh, sales are being done uh, in the e-commerce market. I wish that the e-commerce market are um, care more about uh, selling uh, legal books, books that are not pirated, uh, and they are being treated as if you know, like if you go to a mall you don't expect a store selling fake stuff. So I think uh, e-commerce uh, website needs to uh, apply the same rule to all the sellers there. And right now, uh, I think the biggest piracy are being done uh, in the e-commerce market compared to you know sending people PDF books on, on, on your phone and on emails. Okay, thank you. What about you, Maria Palante? In the United States, anything announced in terms of stimulus package for um, publishing? Not publishing specifically, but we had a, a very intense period of stimulus funding from the national government. And uh, it was aimed in primarily two directions. One was schools, uh, so stimulus money uh, for schools, and the other was for small businesses. So that included things from ranging from tax credits to paycheck protection to actual stimulus funding for small businesses. And small businesses, of course, includes authors, publishers, and booksellers. So we were grateful for that. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but, but um, you know, is it sustainable and will it continue? And at what point um, does the economy kick in again? Yeah. Big question. The, those are all like very valid, important questions. What about uh, in Russia, Vladimir? I know that the Russian government deferred taxes and offered soft loans. Were these effective? Uh, yeah, the Russian government uh, put uh, booksellers and book, uh, book publishers uh, uh, on the list of the most crisis-struck uh, industries. And uh, uh, it uh, actually... Uh, open the access to the publishers and booksellers to the economic stimulus packages, which included um, tax credits and uh, extension of insurance charges and uh, uh, interest-free credits to cover minimum wages for the publishers and booksellers uh, for the personnel to be written off if 90% uh, of the staff is kept employed until the end of 2020. Mm -hmm. uh, secondly, the three largest publishing companies were announced in institutionally important companies, put on the list of uh, national institutionally important companies, which uh, uh, means they get loans with a governmental subsidized interest rate, which is, not, which is nice. Uh, 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 um, at the same moment, um, uh, at the Moscow International Book Fair, uh, the distributors... Uh, uh, digital platforms, uh, uh, publishers, booksellers are now discussing the outcome of those measures introduced for the gov uh, by the government, all these supportive measures, and uh, uh, analyzing the current practices in order to help the whole chain to bounce back. And the results of the discussions will 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 send to IP to the IPA and probably discuss at the governmental level as well. Thank you, Vladimir. I look forward to uh, receiving yeah, that information. One, one thing. The Moscow yes. Bookstore, for the first time, is being subsidized by the local gov Moscow government and the federal government. So the um, uh, the publishers are exploiting themselves uh, free of charge, and we are 
uh, incorporating also the uh, huge advertising campaign with broad coverage uh, in electronic and printed media, which would generate lots of useful and productive contents. Uh, by doing that, we are supposing that the purchasing habits of Russian readers would be restored. Okay, we're all looking to Moscow now to learn from any of your best practices and really replicate them in, in subsequent book fairs. And we wish you all the best uh, for the upcoming book fair. Thank you. Our time is up, unfortunately. It's been a wonderful conversation with all of you, my esteemed panelists. Um, it's been really great to have you. I just want to thank you for being part of this discussion today, and I hope we can continue this conversation. I also want to remind our viewers that the I IPA call to action will be available on the IPA website, internationalpublishers.org. So please click the website and go and have a look at the IPA call to action. Um, and I want to thank everybody for tuning in and being with us here today. Thank you very much. All the best. Thank you very Bye, much. everyone. Thank you, Bob. And thank you, Badur, thank you, Badur, for the excellent moderation. Thank you. Thank you, Badur. It was great. Thank you very much. Bye-bye to all of you. Bye. Bye. See you offline. <laughs> See you offline. Hopefully very soon. See you soon. Bye.